morning, folks. Wonderful to see you all here this morning and glad that we're back together. And even though it's nice to, uh, you know, Sunday mornings can just relax, I am um, always truly encouraged when I get together with my family, my church family. And uh, there's just something about gathering together, isn't there? There's something about coming together, not just praising the name of Jesus, but, you know, seeing your church family. You know, we go through all our week doing our own things, but then we come together on Sunday and um, we just see everyone's smiling faces. And I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm always encouraged uh, by that. And so this morning, I just want to share something that's been brewing on my heart for a couple of months now. And I believe it's a word in season that God has to give us um, to help us on our journey. So everyone know what this thing is? Yeah, have you got one? All right, so grab it out because you're going to need it today or pull out your device and open up your Bible app if that's the way you go these days. I know I'm a bit old school, I still like it like this. It's a bit hard to hit someone over the head with a, a mobile phone. This morning I want to talk to you about honour. You might have guessed that by the slide. Um, so let's get our Bibles and go to Luke 4. We're going to start in verse 14. All right, hands up when you get there. Awesome. I'll wait a couple more minutes for those of you that aren't quite there yet. Luke 4, verse 14. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. And he stood up to read. The scroll on the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him, and were amazed at his gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they were asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what you have, we have heard that you did in Capernaum. i tell you the truth, he continued. No prophet is accepted in his hometown. Let's stop there. So here we see that Jesus, as was his custom, went into the synagogue on the Sabbath. And it says they were amazed at his words, but then something clicked. They said, hang on, isn't this Joseph's son? We know this bloke. He grew up here in this village. We saw him running around as a kid. We saw him you know, kicking the soccer ball around and doing things like other kids. We know this bloke. This is Joseph's son. We're going to go to a couple of other versions of this story that we find in the gospel. So you're going to have your work cut out for you today. And if I beat you there with one hand, you need practice in looking up things in your Bible. So let's go to Matthew 13. Okay, on there. You there? Awesome. 54. Matthew 13, 54. 
Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogues, and they were amazed. Where did this man get his wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? And then again, there's that switch. In verse 55, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where did this man get all these things? In verse 57, and they took offence at him. But Jesus said to him, only in his hometown and in his own house is a prophet without honour. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. Okay, one more, Mark, chapter 6. Okay, verse 1 to 5. Again, it's the same story. Jesus left there in verse 1 and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that has been given him, that he even does miracles? Verse 3, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas and Simon? Aren't they his sisters here? With us, and they took offence at him. Jesus said to them, Only in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own house, is a prophet without honour. And verse 4 He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. I've underlined there in verse 5 the words could not. That's an astounding declaration. It's not that Jesus would not, but he could not. Jesus here was restrained. In a sense, he had his hands tied. Why? Because of a lack of honour. Jesus wanted to do the miracles, but he could not. He was restrained. And that's an astounding thought, that the Son of God, the creator of heaven and earth, could be restrained. He could not do any miracles there because of a lack of honour. Jesus was dishonoured. Why? In basic terms, to dishonour is to think of as common think of as common. When we know someone, when we are familiar with them, that is the most dangerous time to dishonour them. Here, these people knew Jesus. He grew up in their midst. They knew his family. And to them, Jesus was just a commoner. And in that, they dishonoured him. Isn't this just Mary's son? Isn't he the carpenter? This bloke built my table and chairs. He charged me 20 bucks an hour for it. They just treated him as common. They didn't treat him as a son of God, which who he rightfully was. And when we compare this story in the preceding um, verses in Mark 5, we see something different. So if you've still got your finger there in Mark 5, let's just go to a story here we find in verse 22. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jarius came here, or came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet. He fell at Jesus' feet. Why? Because Jarius recognised who Jesus was. He didn't see him as someone common. He didn't see him as the lad down the street. He saw him as the son of God, and he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying, please come. Put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. Now we've got another story here in verse 25. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. 
She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up and, uh, behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I could just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And immediately her bleeding stopped. And she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. So immediately before Jesus was dishonoured in the synagogue amongst those that he knew, there was two examples here of two different people who recognised who Jesus was. Jairus was a synagogue ruler, a Jewish man. But he recognised who Jesus was. The lady with the issue of bleeding, she risked her life because she knew that if she could just get close to Jesus, he would be the answer to her prayers. She was an outcast. And by being in the crowd, she was put, literally putting her life at risk. But she honoured Jesus that much, she was willing to push through to get to him. Two examples where people honoured Jesus and received what they had asked for. So if dishonour is to think of something as common, then the flip side of that is that honour is to hold something or someone as valuable. I've uh, brought a pair of sneakers over here. Now these sneakers, you could think, oh, they're just a common pair of sneakers. Okay, they're a bit dirty, they uh, probably need a little bit of a wash. And so we're not going to put any honour in those sneakers. They're just a pair of sneakers, right? But what if I told you, actually these sneakers were the pair that Ash Barty wore to win the Australian Open recently. All of a sudden, they become something of value. And we, we honour... We give honour to them because of what they represent. Whereas before we just thought of them as something that's common. And so honour is to put value on something. And we're going to uh, expand on that a little bit later. By the way, they're Janetus' sneakers. and <laughs> Don't go stealing them because then I'll have to buy another pair. Okay, But you get my point, don't you? You get my point. All right, I told you we're going to do some uh, finger work today. Go to Luke 5. One more story I want to look at. Luke 5, we're going to start in verse 17. If you're there, yell out Amen. All right. One day, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law, who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, were sitting there. And the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. Now just remember that. Then some men came carrying a paralytic on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. Verse 31. The Pharisees and the teachers of the Lord began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can give forgive sins? but God alone. Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take a mat and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what 
he was lying on and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. And they were all filled with awe and said, We have seen remarkable things today. Verse 17, this story tells us that the power of God was there to heal the sick. Now let's put this into a bit of context. Jesus was in a home and there was such a crowd there, it was literally standing room only. Now who would think that in amongst all those people there would have been others there that needed healing? Is that a fair enough assumption? That there would have been others there that had gone there seeking healing. And it says the power of God was there to heal them. But the story says only the paralytic was healed. Why? Because again, Jesus was restrained. In their thinking, all right, not in their words or their actions, but in their thinking, they said, Who is this man? Who is this man? That he thinks that he can forgive sin. They did not recognize who was in front of them. And therefore, only the man who had been brought there by his friends had received what he had gone to seek. And so we see that dishonour not only comes with our words or our actions, but also in our hearts and in our thinking. We can dishonour people in our thinking. When we do not recognise who they are, or what value they are to us in our life. At this point, you might be asking, how can I honour a person who is evil or responsible for doing bad things? All right, let's go to Scripture again. 1 Samuel, verse 1. A bit more of a walk back into the Old Testament. 1 Samuel, verse 1. Verse 12. Chapter 1, verse 12. It's the story of Hannah and Eli. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. So here Eli the priest dishonoured Hannah by accusing her falsely. He thought that she was there, she was drunk in the temple. But Hannah didn't sort of turned back and said, are you idiot? You don't know what you're talking about. No. She referred to him as my Lord. She still honoured him and recognised who Eli was. Even though she was being falsely accused by him, she did not dishonour him because she knew that he was a priest. And so she referred to him in verse... Uh, Verse 15, not so, my Lord. She recognised who he was and continued to honour him. In Daniel 3 and verse 16, let's quickly, quickly skip over there. Daniel 3, verse 16. You there? All right. Now, we all know this story of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how they refused to bow down to the king's edict. 
and basically they were condemned to death. King Nebuchadnezzar was furious that they were not obeying his command and he'd sentenced them to death. Uh, where will we start there? Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to serve us from them. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. You see that? Again, they didn't uh, get furious in their words and actions. They did not dishonor the king. They referred to him as O king. They recognized who Nebuchadnezzar was. They didn't agree with it, what he was doing. Some might say they were being rebellious against the king, but they weren't being against, rebellious against the king. They were being loyal to their God. And they still recognized Nebuchadnezzar as king. And so for us, this tells us that we honor people not because of their actions, we honor them because of who they are and the position they hold. Can I say that again? We don't honor people because of their behavior. We honour them because of who they are and the position they hold. This leads us to ask, who should we honour then? Well, Scripture tells us there's three groups of people we should honour. The first are our leaders. We should honour our leaders. Our civil leaders, such as our Prime Minister, our elected councillors, our Mayor, those people who hold office as our civil leaders, we need to honour them. We need to recognise who they are. Now you might think, oh, I know that councillor. I grew up, they live just down the road. I know who they are, I know they're a bit of a rat bag. But see, in your thinking, you're dishonouring them. Whereas now they've been elected by the people as the mayor of Griffith. And we should honour them in that. Romans 13. Okay, let's keep going with our walk through the Bible. Romans 13, 1 to 7. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authority. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, say consequently. He who rebels against the authority is doing what? Rebelling against God. And what he has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Just let that sink in for a moment. When we dishonour that which God has put in place, we are dishonouring God. Just hold on to that thought as we uh, look at this a bit further. Our family leaders, we should honour our family leaders, such as our parents. Let's not go there, but in Exodus 20, verse 12, and again in Ephesians 6, verse 2, it says the same thing. Honour your father and mother. And this comes with a promise that you will live a long life. Honour your father and your mother. This comes with a promise, my friend. Now, you might have had the worst parents in the world, but Jesus and the Bible don't put any conditions on this. Again, it's not about their behaviour. It's not about what they do or don't do. It's about who they are. 
They are your father and your mother. And there is a responsibility and a burden on us to honour them in our actions, in our thoughts and in our words. Because in dishonouring them, we dishonour God. If we've read the flood account in Genesis, we see that after the flood subsided, okay, Noah planted a vineyard, uh, he crushed the grapes and he got drunk. And as he was lying in his tent, naked, his son walked in on him and exposed his nakedness. And it says, the Bible says that his son was cursed because of this. Why? Because he exposed his father's nakedness. Whereas the other sons, they honoured their father by getting a blanket and covering him his nakedness, so that he would not be ashamed. So we honour our civil leaders. We honour our family leaders. We honour our social leaders. Who are they? They're our bosses, our teachers, our doctors. Colossians. He books over. Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Egan, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians 3, verse 22. Slaves. Okay, in our modern terms, we put that as employees. Obey your earthly bosses in everything. And do it not only when their eye is on you to win their favour, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for men. We honour our employers. The Bible is quite clear on this. And the last group of leaders that I want to make a point on is that we need to honour our church leaders, such as our pastors and our elders. Again, the Bible is quite clear on this, so if we go over to Hebrews, I just don't want you to take my word for it. Hebrews 13 Verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden. For that would be of no advantage to you. He's talking about your church leaders, your pastors and elders. It doesn't mean we necessarily agree with everything. But we still honour them because they hold position in our life. You know, the thing we need to remember is that in any kingdom there is rank, there is order and there is authority. We see that Jesus honoured the Roman centurion when he expressed this. He called him a man of great faith. And here is something we need to remember. As in any kingdom, the kingdom of God is not a democracy. And I'll say that again. The kingdom of God is not a democracy. It's what they call a theocracy. If Jesus is at the head... And then those whom Jesus has appointed in authority to the church, such as those stated in Ephesians 4.11, your pastors, your prophets, your apostles, your teachers, your evangelists. These gifts are given to the church. The 
Bible is quite clear on this. And when we honour these gifts given to us, in other words, we value them and not see them as commoners, we receive the blessing of God through them. Can I say that again? When we honour these people who have been placed in our church as gifts given to us by God, which is clearly stated in Ephesians 4, Christ gave them as gifts to the church. that we will receive the blessing of God through them because we value them, we honour them for who they are. And the trouble is when we get too familiar with them, there's that danger that we see them as common. We see them as no longer being of value in our life or see them as a gift that they are truly to us. Now this really goes against the grain for most of us. Because culturally we don't like putting people up on a pedestal. We'd rather rip them down off it, don't we? But we'll touch on this a bit later. My friend, we can learn a lot from our islanders and those that are of Asian descent in our church. They are much better at expressing honour than we Aussies. And yet the word is clear. Receive them, receive their reward. If we receive them, in other words, if we honour them and see who they truly are and the blessing they are to us in our life, we'll receive a re the reward from God through them. I remember, and I think I've told this story before, when I first started coming to church, I always used to love hearing Pastor Dave preach. Every time he preached, I just I felt something was imparted into me. Okay, I would go there with great expectation and I would receive something from the Lord. Why? Because I honoured him as someone who was valuable to me in my life. He was my pastor. Someone that God had put in my life. I didn't fully understand it at the time, but in my thoughts and my actions, that's what I was doing. But then when his wife, Billy, who was also a pastor, would preach, I wouldn't hold her in the same esteem. I would think, ah, oh, that's just Billy. That's David's wife. What's she going to impart into my life? You know what? It was self-fulfilling. That thought was self-fulfilling. I would receive nothing of what she was sharing because I didn't honour, I didn't esteem her. I didn't place true value on who she was and what God was doing through her to impart into my life. And so I didn't receive that reward. My friends, this could be a challenge, it could be a rebuke. I don't know where you are in your life. But we need to hear what God is saying clearly through his word. If you're not going to expect you will not receive. If you don't receive someone as someone who is valuable that God has placed in your life, why? Because we grew up with them, we kick around with them now, we are dishonouring them, we are dishonouring God. This is truly a challenge for each one of us. Do you love me? So they're our leaders. Honour your leaders. You might not always necessarily agree with them. Guess what? Suck it up, sunshine. They are still being used mightily by God in our life. And we need to honour them for who they are. They are someone that God has placed in our life. And if we are going to shun them, we will receive nothing. We also need to honour our peers. Let's hit, hop over to Matthew. How are your fingers going? Are you keeping up? Matthew 10 and verse 41. Here 
here it is here. Anyone who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. You got that? If you receive him as a prophet because he is a prophet, you will receive the blessing of God through him as a prophet's reward. It doesn't say if you receive him because he's a good bloke or because you agree with everything he's saying. You're receiving him as the gift of God that he is, or she is. Okay, when I say he, just remember, that's all inclusive of gender. So enough on that. But it also says, and anyone who receives a righteous person because they are a righteous person will receive a righteous man's reward. I want to ask you, who is the righteous person? If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you have been made righteous. So the person sitting right next to you, look at them. They are righteous. So you need to receive them and honour them as a righteous person. And you're just elbowing them in the ridge and saying, ah, you're mine. You're my sister. You're my brother. You know? Again, can you see that in treating them as common, we are dishonouring them. But they are righteous. They are valuable, not only to God, but to us as well. So we honour our leaders, we honour our peers. We honour those that are entrusted to us, our spouses and our children. While we're still there in Matthew, let's look at verse 42. If anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he's my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. Talking about honouring the children, those that we think are beneath us. In um, 1 Peter, I think it is, 1 Peter 3, 7. I've written this one down just to give you a break. The same goes for you husbands. Be good husbands to your wives. Honour them. Delight in them. As women, they lack some of your advantages. But in the new life of God's grace, you're equals. Treat your wives then as equals so your prayers don't run aground. But not only in Matthew is it talking about the children, in 1 Peter it's talking about our spouses. To honour them. Not to see them as someone common, but to see them as who they truly are, a gift of God in our life. The Bible is clear that children are a gift of God. Who would agree with that? Absolutely. And let's recognise that your husband or your wife, whichever the case may be, is a gift of God in your life. Okay, You can look at them and go, oh, Now the warning and challenge here is not to confuse honour with worship. It's not about worshipping them, it's about recognising who they are. If you remember the two stories we looked at before, Hannah referred to Eli the priest as my Lord, recognised him in his position. And the same with uh, the Israelite boys, with King Nebuchadnezzar, O King they addressed him as. So finishing up, here's a question I want to leave with you. Why do we need to honour, not just the gifts in our life, but why do we need to honour each other? See, as you grow up in church, you get to know people on an intimate level. But the danger with that is that they become common to you. They become that familiar that they're just commoners. They're just your mate. They're just someone you hang around with. 
But the reason we need to honour each other is simple. Because God sent His only Son that He would die for them. The person sitting next to you, the person in your life, everyone around us as part of this church body, Christ died for you. He saw you as that valuable that he died for you so that you would not perish but have eternal life. Of what greater value has been placed on your life that we should think of you as any less? Every person that you look at this morning is valuable in God's sight. And I challenge you to see them as valuable in your sight as well. It's one of the things I love about coming to church. For me, coming to church is not about ticking a box and getting in God's good books. Okay? It's about coming to meet with you. Why? Because I'm expecting an impartation of joy and encouragement from you as we sit down and have a cup of coffee or sit down and have a chat. That as I hear about your week and you hear about my week, we can mutually encourage one another. We can laugh, we can cry, we can pray together. We can honour one another. Why? Because I see you as important. I see you as someone of value. I don't see you above me. I don't see you below me. We are equals. Can we just meditate on that for a moment? That we are all valuable. And we ought to love one another with that same value and respect that Jesus loves us. If we want to be Christ-like, then that's a good starting point. Amen? Amen. In the death of Christ, that terrible, horrific, torturous death on a cross, and ultimately in his resurrection, God shows that each and every one of us are honoured in his sight. Every person is valuable to God, our Father, so it only makes sense that people should be valuable to each one of us. To dishonour someone is to dishonour God. That in itself is a challenge we all encounter. Let's pray. And as we're praying, if the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you and challenging you in your thoughts, let us take this moment in our prayer to repent before God. You can kneel where you are, in where you are sitting. You can kneel. But if you have, as the Holy Spirit has prompted you, that you are dishonouring someone in your thoughts or in your actions or in your words, or if you have dishonoured someone, then take this time to repent. Take this time to come before God and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Thank you for reminding me through your word of what I need to do in honouring those people around me, in honouring the leaders you have put in my life, in honouring all that you have given me. So can we take that moment right now? You know each and every one of our hearts. Lord, you know our desire is to be more like you every day. So I pray that we take the challenge of this word that you brought to light this morning and you help us to change our way, to change the way we think, to change the way we speak, to change the way we act, to honour those and see those that you have placed in our life as valuable because you have put them there in our life, whether they are a parent, a brother or sister, a pastor or an elder, a boss. Lord, we honour them all this morning in your sight. 
Help us to do this, Father, every day. Help us honour them, Lord. Even when we don't agree with them, Lord, your word is clear. We still need to honour them. We still need to recognise who they are and what you have called them to do in your kingdom. We thank you, Father, for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. My friends, God bless you. Pray the word of God has encouraged you this morning. You know, repentance is more than just saying sorry. Can I stress that? Repentance is more than just saying sorry. It's about changing our ways. So if you've been challenged this morning, the Holy Spirit has poked you in your spirit, then don't just say sorry, Lord. Actively seek how we can change our thinking. Actively seek how we can change our, the way we think about someone or the way we act towards someone. Honour one another, people. Honour those that are around you. Honour the person at the grocery store checking your items through the checkout. Let's actively seek ways to honour one another. Amen? All right. Give the person next to you a high five.